morning, MVC family. How are we doing this morning? Good to see you uh, on this Sunday morning, a warm Sunday morning. How many were out in the sun yesterday? Got a little baked or a little wilted or something, right? And it's going to be a warm one today as well, but it's nice in here, and that we're glad uh, you are here to worship the Lord with us. You might notice a few purple shirts around here today. Uh, our teens, Pastor Colin, Lisa, returned from a uh, week of camp up at, uh, yeah, thank you, Rock Mountain. I almost said Mountain View. I said, that's not right. Rock Mountain. And uh, maybe Pastor Colin will give you a little bit of report on that. I'm hearing great, uh, uh, great uh, things happen this week uh, up at camp. So we're here to worship the Lord this morning. Um, we're studying in the book of Colossians about the preeminence of Christ. We're going to sing about his glory, that he is first place in our lives. We even got a new song that we're going to introduce to you this right this morning, right, Alex? Right. And uh, I, I'm excited about the song. It's got some great words. Come behold the wondrous mystery of who Christ is. It'll be easy to learn. It's a verse-by-verse um, hymn type of song, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So let's stand together, and we're going to begin by singing Crown Him with Many Crowns. Let's lift our praise to the Lord this morning.
taken me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you. My world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. I love you, I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. Good morning. You guys looking forward to that day when Jesus comes back? 
I cannot wait. It's going to be so, so awesome to be there. Woo! Good one. It's a good one. Hey, a uh, few announcements to let you guys know about. Things going on this week. Uh, kind of a normal week for the most part in front of us. Uh, teen ministry Wednesday night. Men's Bible, I'm sorry, prayer breakfast Thursday morning. Uh, maybe the one difference, of course, is going on today. Uh, following the service this morning, you are all invited to stick around for lunch. And uh, then a quarterly business meeting following that. And uh, we'd love to have you be in on that. And uh, so that will be going on today, right following the morning service. So do not forget about that. Hey, but looking ahead down the road a little bit, we got several different things coming up. Community Chicken Barbecue, the August 9th, Family Movie Night Under the Stars on the 16th. Uh, but preceding all that is really kind of the next big thing on our agenda, and that, of course, is Vacation Bible School. We are getting down to crunch time with that. And uh, so let me just, again, remind you about a few different things in relation to that. First of all, August 3rd through 7th, Monday through Friday, from 9 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock in the afternoon every day. All kids ages 4 through 12 are invited to be part of that. And uh, once again, back there on the table in the foyer, if you are going back that direction today, there are several things that we would encourage you to take advantage of. Uh, if you have kids who are coming, get them registered ahead of time. Pre-registration cards out there. It saves a little time, a little effort. Also, some invitation flyers and posters, and we would love to have you guys help us be able to spread the word. Uh, once again, we are making the move to doing vast majority of this outside, trying to provide the safest environment that we possibly can, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, in addition to that, still looking for some volunteers. If you'd be willing to help out, and even if you can only do a couple days, but you'd be willing to pop in, I'm sure we can work you into the system there, and I uh, would love to have you with that. Uh, but also, still in need of some items as well. Uh, so let me just very quickly just let you guys know anything nautical that you might have at home, all right, uh, rowboats, oars, life vest, anything along those lines, idle on them, all right? And uh, so if you would let me know about that, uh, I'd love to be able to get a hold of those as part of our decorating. Also, I'm going to be needing several of those pop-up tents. So if you have one of those and you'd be willing to let us loan that, loan that to us for the week, I uh, need quite a few of those as we're going to be setting up some different stations. And uh, so if you would let me know about that as well. And uh, just to kind of give you guys a little heads up, next week there will be a sign-up sheet that we'll be posting for some of the food items that we're going to be needing for snacks. And I know, again, we're kind of running a little bit short on time with that. Uh, but if you have any questions, you can even start to pick Phyllis's brain a little bit now. She's the person in charge of that. And uh, she would be glad to kind of give you an idea of what we're going to be looking for there. All right? Uh, but it's going to be a great week. We're looking forward to it tremendously. And uh, so uh, those are all, again, tying back into Vacation Bible School coming up here the first week of August. And uh, so a couple other things you guys can read about in your bulletins there. Uh, also just want to say thank you uh, for those of you who have been praying for our teens as uh, we have been gone at camp all week long. What a great week. I just cannot say enough again for the staff up there at Rock Mountain. They're one of the few places that made camp happen this year. And a uh, tremendous, tremendous job. And I'm uh, just so thankful for them. And uh, just kind of give you an idea of everything that happened this week. I mean, there's so much you can kind of put this all together. Uh, but we had at least two young people to come to know Christ this week. I mean, that's what it's all about right there. Uh, we saw, even within our own group, we had one young man for the first time in his life say three memory verses, which was incredibly awesome. Uh, we had several of our older guys especially kind of learned a little about themselves as far as being leaders this week, and uh, really neat to see them step up, and uh, just a tremendous time, again, bonding with other believers, a lot of different backgrounds there, uh, but being able to open up the truth of God's word, being able to share that, and to see that make a difference in young people's lives. Um, over 90 kids, which under the circumstances uh, is just a tremendous number to be getting into camp there, and uh, so my thank you to all of you again for making uh, us part of your prayers throughout the week. And uh, for what God did and uh, moving in hearts and uh, for Jill and Beth also for taking the time to get up and back and helping us with transportation and all that good kind of thing. Uh, Cody, I got to give you a shout out there. All week long. All right. I mean, you're talking about 24 hour job and uh, really that's what he put in last week uh, uh, for five days, six days, uh, uh, really. He did a great job with our guys. Really, really appreciate him. He put up with Holden all week. So, you know, he there's a reward right there, but uh, they did a great job. I really appreciate the effort that he's been putting out there, too. So, uh, again, thank you for praying, and uh, 
Thank you for making it possible. Let me just say, this is kind of weird, but let me just say, I realize with all this COVID-19 stuff that's been going on, you know, it's most of it's not been a whole lot of fun. But what it did for us this year is it left my youth budget so much intact that I was actually able to pretty much pay the vast majority for these kids to go. We had 16 kids go to this this year, which is tremendous. And, you know, you're always learning to learn to look for the good in the midst of the bad, all right? So there's one of them, all right? We had a lot left in the youth budget. We were able to help these kids get there, and the Lord really moved in their hearts. So, again, thank you for all your support in that, and uh, we just praise him for what he did, all right? All right, let's stand together, take off all your buttons. No, don't do that, <laughs> but stand up, and um, we're not doing the official greeting thing, but you can turn around and say hello, just don't touch each other, all right? And the children are dismissed for junior church at this time, all right? Just wave a quick hello. There you go. Good job. Yep, I'm going to do it. Yep, I'm going to do it. I'm going to announce it right now. <laughs> I got you, Jim. <laughs> Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Just a couple other quick announcements, and then I have a couple of uh, prayer requests that I want to share with you as well. Um, as part of the VBS week, remember we do the Sunday after VBS, we do our community chicken barbecue, and that's a major summer event here. Everything got pushed from July to August because of, uh, you know, the COVID thing, and we're, we're playing a little bit of catch-up ball. But we're still going to do the barbecue, and uh, we call it a community barbecue because we want you to invite friends and neighbors. We do it so that we can invite the families of... Um, the VBS kids from the community to come for a free meal, minister to them, talk to them about the Lord, about our church. But uh, you uh, be preparing to come for that. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer on the bulletin board. We just took the sign-up sheet down for the uh, quarterly business meeting luncheon today, and now you got a new sign-up sheet. Must, must be things are getting back to a little bit of normal when people are signing up for food, you know? But that's a good thing. Um, so sign up. We need to get, it's very important for Jim to know uh, how much chicken to order, and then we're asking you to bring a dish to pass that day as well. It's going to be a fun event. Looking forward to that. Um, we'll talk to you a little bit more in coming weeks about our movie night underneath the stars on the 16th. We're going to be uh, showing a Christian film there, and that'll be another opportunity for some, some good fellowship. Um, then also, um, Something else is happening on Sunday, August 9th, after the chicken barbecue. Uh, some of you might know who Emily Mowry is. She used to be known as Emily Higley, right? But uh, Emily has really achieved something pretty neat. She has graduated. Uh, what is the name of her degree, Clint or Bonnie? Juris Doctorate. She's a lawyer, right? She's going to be a lawyer. And uh, she graduated, and the Higleys are having an open house for Emily uh, celebration from 2 to 6 on August 9th as well. Man, that's great. You get to stuff yourself with chicken at the barbecue. 
then drive 20 minutes out to the Higley's and they'll stuff you full of ice cream and cookies and stuff too. It's going to be a stuffable day. Um, but it'll be a great day of celebrating Emily's accomplishments and we are indeed very proud of her. Two quick uh, uh, prayer requests I want to share with you as well. Um, uh, we've been praying for Bill Miner. He uh, was in the hospital this last week. He was discharged, praise the Lord. He's home and uh, doing well. Got this card from Bill and Sandy, and they say, Thank you all for your prayers and support during Bill's stay at the hospital. Thank you for the lovely fruit basket. Hope to be back in church soon, Bill and Sandy. Um, remember, uh, just as a reminder, we are doing our live stream services now. I have an inkling that probably Bill and Sandy are watching right now. So uh, and on behalf of the whole congregation, I'm waving hi to Bill and Sandy. And Cindy Sprout, she told me she loves the, uh, the live stream. Others that can't come out are, are watching it. So that's a good ministry, and we're, we're grateful for that. I have one other um, prayer request to share, you, share with you. This is my, my heart is heavy on this, very sad. Um, a good brother, fellow pastor at... Uh, what used to be Summit Baptist Bible Church, they, they uh, renamed their church Hillside Haven Church. It's right near, uh, right next to Abingdon Heights High School. Uh, Pastor Don Rowe was called home to be with the Lord um, as a result of a motorcycle accident. And uh, so my heart is heavy. Uh, that's the church that Colleen and I were Integrally, integrally involved in while I was on staff at Baptist Bible Seminary. We know a lot of the people there. I'm sure their hearts are heavy this morning as they are gathering and uh, they're missing their under-shepherd and uh, he's home with the Lord. So if you think of it, be praying for the Roe family and for Hillside Haven Community Church, a sister church that's going through a tough time right now. Isn't it good to know the Lord when we walk through difficult circumstances in life and know that He's our rock, He's our foundation, we can trust in Him. Let's pray together and we're going to look at the scriptures this morning. Father God, thank You for who You are. Thank You that You are the lover of our souls. Thank You for Your master plan in redeeming us from sin. Thank you for putting us on a rock. Uh, our lives that were shipwrecked and going the wrong direction, you rescued. You gave us your grace and your salvation, undeserved by all of us, not of works lest any of us could boast, but only by your grace you've transformed us and redeemed us. And we shout hallelujah to your name for the wondrous mystery of who Christ is what he's done in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for bringing Bill back home and continue to minister to him and strengthen him. Lord, we do pray for the Roe family this morning and our fellow brothers and sisters at Hillside Haven Community Church, that you would bring your arms of comfort and love around them as they are missing uh, and, and even celebrating the life of their, their faithful pastor. Uh, bring strength and help in time of need for that family and church family. And then God, help us as we search the scriptures today to find our way to declare what we already know to be true, and that is that Jesus must be first place in our lives. Help us not to say it just, but to live it fully. And to find out from the scriptures how you have prepared us and qualified us to be trophies of your grace, showing forth the glory of Jesus Christ in our lives. We are different people because of your mark of ownership on us. And we want to demonstrate to a world that desperately needs truth and love what that looks like in the person of Jesus living in and through us. Help us as we study your word. May your Holy Spirit open our hearts and minds to receive your truth, to apply it to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 
Join me in Colossians chapter 1 this morning. Uh, We just got started last week on this new series, Keeping Jesus First, uh, Practicing the Preeminence of Christ. And it comes from this letter to the Colossian church that was written many centuries ago, yet is still very relevant for our lives today. Um, I can't think of anything Uh, more important as we march through difficult times to proclaim Jesus as the true uh, Son of God that has come to deliver people from their sin. Now, when we say that we want to practice preeminence, probably we ought to start by the reminder of what are we talking about when we talk about preeminence. And it simply means that Jesus Christ is first place in all things. It comes from the Greek word proteuo. Uh, It it is a dominion. It is a kingdom word. It is a lordship word where we recognize that God the Father, uh, and it's interesting after our series uh, on the teaching ministry of Christ, hear, hear him that now we're looking at his person and what he has accomplished, and God the Father has set him up to be the preeminent one, prominent in creation in the church and personally in our lives. So here's here's some introductory questions we asked last week about this. Who or what really is first place in my life? Have we let Jesus slip off the throne of our own lives. One of the songs that uh, I remember Colleen and I used to sing a lot when we were first married, I think we did it in school, was that song, and I probably mentioned it to you before, Jesus be the Lord of all the kingdoms of my heart. Uh, In my heart are kingdoms that are only known by me and God. Only you know who's ruling in your life this morning, right? You know whether God still occupies occupies first place in your life or not. There's no guessing game to it. You know whether you're serving God. You know whether He still has captured your heart, do you not? Or has something replaced it? Some shiny toy? Some other person that might have led you astray from your love for God? Well, That's an important question to ask. If if, if we want to keep Jesus first, we have to begin by asking, is he right now first place in my life? Secondly, why does that person or thing occupy that place of prominence? If Jesus has slipped off the throne, he didn't move any place. You moved him. You pushed him aside. Why? Why? What person or thing has greater value than the one that deserves to be the Lord, the leader of your life, of my life? And then this last question, if we're going to keep him first or get him back to where he uh, deserves, has Jesus earned the right to be first in my life? Do we say it or do we really believe it and do we practice it? Now last week when we introduced this, we talked about the fact that we'd been, we have been prepared for Christ's preeminence in two ways. Number one, God made an initial investment in me. He made me a saint. Did you know that? You're a saint. I'm looking at a bunch of saints this morning. Now, we don't usually use that term freely, do we? I, I don't come into church in the morning and say, you know, good morning, St. Tom. Although I could, that would be accurate. Uh, Hi, St. Frank, how are you today? Um, You know, we'd probably hang our heads and say, wow, I I, I don't think I deserve this title. You're right, you don't. But it's by the grace of, you know what the word saint means? It's such a misunderstood term because of what religious groups have done to it. They think a saint is embodied in some statue in a church someplace, or that they have some ill-conceived halo over their head. No. A saint means that you have been set apart 
to exemplify, to glorify Jesus who is first place in your life. We are different people. Peter even calls us peculiar people. He doesn't mean that in a negative sense. He means it in a particular sense, that we're different. Do you shine Jesus in your life? I always come up here before our worship team gets singing, and I, I, I tease Merida. Merida is so easy to tease, I'll tell you. And now she brought Amelia with her, and Amelia is just as easy to tease. And I, and I tell them, are you girls smiling as you sing? Are you going to shine Jesus today? And they say, yeah, Pastor, we know. Get out of here. Let us do our thing, you know. Uh, but we ought to have a different aura about us. Uh, St. Jack likes to talk about the Marines, but he also likes to talk about Jesus. I've learned that about him. We all ought to have that if Christ is first place in our lives. Now, here's what we're going to look at today. If we're talking about preeminence, Jesus being first place in our lives, the Apostle Paul is willing to prove it to us this morning that, that is, that's exactly what needs to happen. We want to look at the proof of preeminence, the proof of preeminence. Um, asking this question, how do I know that Jesus is far superior to anyone else and actually deserves to be first place in my life? Paul answers those questions. Now, why will he answer these questions? Remember the group we talked about last week called the Gnostics, the G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, Gnostics, only silent G. The Gnostics did not believe in the supremacy of Christ. They did not believe that Jesus Christ, God, would want to dwell in the flesh because they had a dualistic approach and philosophy of life. Everything of the flesh and material things was evil. Everything of the mind and spirit was good. They, they turned the life-changing gospel into a dead philosophy of knowledge. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis or knowledge. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that knowledge puffs up. But real knowledge of Christ, applied wisdom, is the gospel, not the type of false knowledge that the Gnostics were talking about. So in refuting the false teaching of the Gnostics, Paul is going to prove to us that Jesus deserves to be first place in my lives. Are you ready to find out how and why that's true? Read with me Colossians chapter 1. I want to begin in verse 12. You follow along as I read. Paul is continuing in the letter and he says, I'm giving thanks to the Father, look at this, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's qualified you to be a saint. All right? Verse 13, he's delivered us from the domain of darkness, and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or rulers, authorities, he created them all. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And then listen to this last phrase that we'll study today. For in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So I want to give you six proofs this morning for the superiority of Christ that have been proven in creation, have been proven in the church, has, have been proven in any matter of life, 
and ought to be the basis why we say, wow, if he's first in all of these things, doesn't he deserve to remain first place in my life? Here's the first proof. Jesus Christ is first in prototype. He's first in prototype. Now, what do we mean by that? Look at verse 15, the beginning part of the verse, 15a. It says there, He is the image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. We cannot see God this morning, can we? That shouldn't be a surprise to us. Jesus declared, God is spirit. Those that worship him have to worship him in spirit and truth. There's not a physicality that we can see about God right now. Although, when could we or when did people actually see God in the flesh when he took on human flesh, when he was incarnated as the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, he is the image of the invisible God. Now, you probably know what that word prototype means, right? A lot of that, probably the easiest example to explain that comes from the auto industry. Like when they're going to uh, do a new vehicle and they're going to create the, the prototype, the first one. You know how important it is to get the first one right? Otherwise, all the rest of them are junk. They fall apart. Prototype, the very first one off the assembly line. And it's interesting that when Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, he uses that prototype imagery to define him. It comes from the Greek word icon, E-I-K-O-N, which means the first of its kind. Do you know why Jesus deserves first place? There's nobody else like him. There's no one else that can say, I am the exact image of God the Father. Now I want to tell you something, a lot of religions don't believe that. If you were sitting in a service this morning conducted by Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, they say, oh no, 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 no. Jesus was just a created being like the rest of the angels. He's no one special. In fact, some of them would even go so far to say that both Jesus and Satan, Lucifer, are equal creations of God because Lucifer was a fallen angel. And that's probably what the Gnostics were teaching as well. Paul said, no, he is the first of its kind. The only one that can claim to say, you want to see God? Look at Jesus. Are any of you Motown fans in here? You can admit it if you want to. A little bit of Motown. I'm not trying to be disrespectful when I say this phrase to help us understand what Paul is saying about Jesus being in the image of God. But I'm going to tell you this, folks, straight out. Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. That's the way it is. And I do not say that disres disrespectfully. There is no one like Jesus Christ. Muhammad doesn't cut it. Buddha doesn't cut it. No one can claim, I am the direct image of God. Do you want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look at these verses that, that tell us the prototypical image of Christ in helping us to understand who God is. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled, it is covered to those who are now perishing. In, though, in whose case the God of this world, who is that, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. What's the last phrase say? who is the image of God. 
the icon of God, the prototype of God. Hebrews 1.3, describing Jesus, says, And He is the radiance of His, the Father's glory. Look at this language. And the exact representation of His nature. Exactly who the Father is, Jesus is. We shouldn't be surprised because Jesus made this claim. You're familiar in the book of John, I've mentioned this before, that the book of John, the main theme is the deity, the godness of Jesus Christ. And throughout the book of John, at various times, Jesus would actually answer people, who are you? And he would say, I am, which is the Jehovah title, Yahweh. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. Jesus was in no way minimizing who he was, that he was from the Father and was the Father. In the beginning was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Look at what he says in John chapter 14, verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said, wait wait a second, Lord. If you will show us the Father, that's good enough for me. Uh, Show us the Father and we'll believe you. What did Jesus say to him? He said, Philip, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say... Philip, show us the Father. Now, Jesus got in a lot of trouble with that statement with the Pharisees. Blasphemy! He claims to be God. Yes, he did, because he is. So when we're talking about Jesus Christ deserving to be first place, we're not talking about some religious prophet. We're not talking about just a great teacher. We're not talking about one of many gods, small g, capital G, prototype, the only one, Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. You can be assured that when you place your life in the hands of Jesus Christ, He deserves that lordship in your life. God designed it to be so. Secondly, um, the second proof of His superiority is his position. The second half of verse 15, first half says he's the image of the uh, invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, it's important we understand what's being said here. When he says the firstborn of creation, it's not a position, it, it, is, a, it is a statement of position, not origin. It's not saying he was the first thing created. It says he preceded everything that was created. Again, most cults refute that. If false teaching is going to get started, it usually starts in a false representation of who Jesus Christ is. They just can't seem to put together that God can exist as fully God and fully man in the person of Jesus. Here's a quote from a theologian who I highly respect, Robert Gramacki, taught at Cedarville University for years. He talks about the difference in understanding the superiority of Christ in position, not origin. He says, in Near Eastern culture, the firstborn of a family, prototokos is the word that would be used as the firstborn of the family, received the birthright and subsequent family headship. It became a title of authority and respect. Now, Paul did not claim that Christ himself was a creature in this regard, the first and highest creature, as charged by many sectarian groups like Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. The phrases following in the text disprove that. Besides, Paul could have used and would have used a different Greek word, protoskistos, if he wanted to show that Christ was the first creature of God's creation. The language is exact. He's not talking about order of creation. He's talking about position over all. Firstborn means priority of position, prototokos. 
So he is superior in prototype. He's superior in position. Let's talk about creation because he's also superior in creation. How do I know that he wasn't the first thing created? Look at what Paul says in the very next verse in verse 16. He says, For by him all things were created. I want to read that again. For by him some of the things you see he created. Is that what it says? Does it say for by him a few of the things that were created were created by No. So it only makes common sense if he created all things he can't create himself. He was from the beginning. All things were created by him. All things are by him and for him in heaven on earth. And he then goes on to give examples. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about things that you can see or you can unsee or, or that you can't see. Did, did Christ create the very DNA in my body, the, the molecular structure that makes me male and not female? Did, did he create the personal, personality traits with him? Yes. He even decreed that by 40 years old, I would have gray hair. I'm going to have a talk with him about that when I get to heaven. But I can't do a thing about it. I'm getting a little bit ahead because when we talk about creation, we talk about the big beginning of creation where all things were created and nothing's changed. We're, we're going to talk about the, the latter, how he holds things together in a minute. But, but this is true. Look at these texts again. John 1, I, I quoted it earlier, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. How? He spoke them into existence. Can you imagine that? Deer, there it is. Been running into, into cars ever since. Trees. Boom. Hills. Boom. Hippopotamuses. Boom. Rhinoceroses. Boom. He speaks. They're there. I find it fascinating to know that God created by the word of his mouth and they popped into being exactly as he intended them to be. If we were there, we'd say, how do you know that's a rhinoceros? And you say, because I said so. Because I have the prototype for a rhinoceros uh, as well. For some reason, that silly little Christmas song, All I Want for Christmas is a Hippopotamus, is coming into my mind right now. I don't know why. But... God created everything. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, nothing came into being that came into being. All that we have and all that we see created by him. It didn't evolve. It didn't change. Now, there are some things that are continuing, continuing to wear down. We'll talk about that in a second. But when God created it all, check it out in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. When he created it all, he said, and it was good. It was good. Not only good, but perfect. God doesn't make junk. He created it all. Look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. This ought to be the marker on our life. Worthy are you, O Lord. This is a heavenly chorus after the church has been raised up to heaven at the rapture. They're singing around the throne of God. Worthy are you, O Lord, and our God to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Because you created all things. And because of your will, they exist and were created. That is a statement of personal preeminence. When we get to heaven, friends, you're going to be singing that song. Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor. Why do you deserve to be first place? Why do you deserve to be Lord of all? Why do you deserve to be Lord of my life? Because you created all things. 
And we were created for the express purpose of pleasing Him. Do you want to know the most miserable position, the most miserable disposition of any person on the face of the earth? It's not a person with cancer. It's not a person (coughs) with financial ruin. It's not a person who's facing all sorts of difficulty. The worst position to be in as a human being on the face of the earth is a person who has been saved by the grace of God but is denying Christ's lordship in their life. Why? Because you're bucking against the very purpose for why God created you. We have been designed so that when we are not fulfilling the purpose of God in us, our hearts aren't happy. Our souls are unfulfilled. There's this battle going on inside of us. Why? Because God wants us to enjoy the fullness of a first place relationship with Him because that's the way He created us to be. And so when we resist that, there's this unsettledness. Listen, a Christian who has denied Christ's lordship and has decided to go it their own way and fool around in sinful practices is a it's a sad thing it's like asking a snake to ride a bicycle how's he going to do that how's he going to pedal those pedals he can't do it wasn't made for that think about that first place in creation means as the designer creator of our lives he knows exactly why we're made how we function and why it is so amazingly beautiful when we're doing that which God created us to do wow all right I gotta we gotta keep going number four here's the other part of creation he's superior in consistency not only did he create it He said, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Consistency. Literally, it means set together or glued, a cohesive force. When he created it, he didn't create it in chaos. Remember, he created a perfect world. It's only when sin entered into the world that now the creation has been set in a spiraling demotion towards eventually melting and passing away and a new heaven and a new earth will be created that will once again reflect the perfection of God's creation. Look at this verse in Hebrews 1, 3. We were in earlier. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Not only did he speak it into creation, but he can hold it together. Uh, I use the illustration of our own DNA. I, I've been told that molecular structure, now I'm not a physicist, I'm not a chemist. If you are, you can correct me if I'm wrong afterwards. But I've been told that even the, the molecular structure of protons, positive, and, uh, and uh, what's the negative one? Electrons? And then there's the neutrons that are the they're nothing. They're like neutral. That's, I guess, why they're called neutrons. Yeah, okay. But, but it left to their own design, they would actually destroy themselves. They, 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 they couldn't exist together unless something was causing them to be cohesive, to exist together. You know what that is? Preeminence of Christ. Paul said it, and if he wrote the book of Hebrews, he said it twice. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Now think of this for a second. If he has the ability to hold creation together, why is it that this old world has just not split apart? Who knows what's going on inside the core of the earth right now? Volcanoes, earthquakes, all sorts of eruptions And yet this world has held together for like 6,000 years now. Why? Because he upholds all things by the word of his power. 
don't you think for a second that if he can hold this world and creation together and keep it from destroying itself, that he can do the same with your life? The one who holds it all together says, hey, (laughs) give me your life. Broken as it is, splintered as it is, broken apart by your own foolish desires and your own pathways to self-destruction, I can hold it together. That's another very good reason why we ought to keep Jesus first place in our lives. All right, two more and we're done. He is also superior in function. Verse 18, now Paul gets very specific to show us an example that we will live with while here on planet earth visibly, and it has to do with the church. Verse 18, he is the head of the body, which is the church. That word head has the connotation of being not only the beginning, the arche, but the chief magistrate or the cornerstone of the church. He's the head of the church. I've said this before. I'll say it again. This is not my church. I don't get to rule this church. And that's not the purpose of a pastor. A pastor is to be a servant leader under the headship of Christ. John 10 tells me that. 2 Peter chapter 5 says that. I'm a servant of the the, the primary shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, Jesus. And he appoints under shepherds to care for the flock. This isn't your church either, where you get to call the shots. Now, in a sense, it's all of our church because we're part of the body, but we, we know that this truth is evident when Jesus is given his rightful position as the head of the church. Amen? I don't know of any church that can function well and produce good fruit unless they're manifesting the headship of Jesus Christ in the church. He deserves preeminence as his church. That's why when we meet for a business meeting, we want to do all things that are decent and in order. We want to manifest that as the head, he controls the body. We are subservient to him. That's why the unity of the body is an important expression of recognizing the headship of Christ, that we resolve differences, that we don't splinter apart. He's the head, we're the body. The same glue that he uses to hold things together, he holds the church together. It's a beautiful picture of how preeminence of Christ works among many people. Paul said it this way in Ephesians 1, verse 19. What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age that will come. And he put, listen to this, all things in subjection under his Christ's feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the very cornerstone of that church in whom the whole building, not the physical building, the building of the body is fitted together, growing into a holy temple in the Lord. The preeminence of Christ in his church is an example of how it's supposed to be done. Here's the last one, and then we're done. The final proof of his superiority is that he is superior in complete fullness. If, as if those first five proofs of his superiority or his preeminence wasn't enough, Paul concludes this part of the passage in verse 19 by saying this, 
For in him, in Jesus, God was pleased that all the fullness of the Godhead dwell in him. It's all about him. In complete fullness, not partially, not just semi, he's not just semi Jesus, he's not just semi God, he is fully God. Paul thought this concluding statement was so important, he repeated it in the next chapter, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. He says, For in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in that statement, I almost think Paul is saying, Take that, Gnostics. He's digging the knife of truth in and saying, you say that Jesus, the Son of God, cannot dwell in bodily form because the flesh is evil, and you say he couldn't be true God to be in bodily form, yet we by faith in the gospel know that this is true, that the only way we are redeemed and bought is through the sacrifice of his body on the tree, right? Right? His body was broken, his blood was shed on our behalf, and here God the Father says, I am telling you that all of the fullness of deity, even when he was on the cross, full deity dwells in bodily form in my Son, Jesus Christ. So what do you think? Does he deserve to be in first place in your life? And has God proven that to you? Are you willing to take the risk? Because it is a risk. Taking your hands off your own life and saying, God, right back at you. It's yours. It's not my life anymore. It's your life. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's why he deserves to be first place in my life. Here's today's takeaway. Jesus Christ does deserve to be first in my life because he is superior. He's superior over me. He created me. He keeps me together. <laughs> he is my head he is my all in all. When we sing that song, that, that's what you're saying. He is my all in all. Secondly, preeminence really is a question of authority, friends. When we say Jesus is preeminent, we're saying he has the authority, he has the right to rule my life. The question is, will Christ have his way with you? Will you not only call him Lord, but will you submit daily to his lordship? And lastly, I will remind you of this. The world who does not know Christ does not accept his preeminence. They don't believe it's in first place. But I want to remind you of something. One day they will. You'll either recognize Jesus Christ as Lord by submitting to him or at the end being judged by him because you were not willing to submit to him. This song was quite popular at an earlier stage in my life. I love the words. It says, They mock his name and slight his word as if it were a fable. They taunt my faith. They scorn me as if I were a fool. But feeble is their reproof and firm is the final truth that all their slandering doesn't mean a thing. For even at this very hour, as the Father pleases, kings shall bow and adore. And nations will kneel down before him, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the preeminent one. A fallen world sinks deeper still in shameless degradation. The crowds increase with those who sin and yet seem to prevail. But saints, fight the faithful fight. Soon wrong will be made right. Do you long for that day? I do. I'm tired of the junk out there. 
I'm tired of seeing evil win. I'm with the psalmist crying out and lamenting to God, God, how long? (laughs) He reminds me, be patient, child. The day is coming. They have no idea. Saints fight the faithful fight. Soon wrong will be made right, and every suffering sacrifice for the cause of Christ will be rewarded on that day when at the name of Jesus kings shall bow and adore and nations kneel down before him and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's a question as we conclude. Why would you want to wait until that day to say it? going to be said it'll be proven we'll ride in on a white horse every knee will bow but what a waste if our lives wait until that day to say it until saying it right now jesus be the lord of all the kingdoms of my heart will you surrender to his lordship will you keep Jesus' first place where he deserves it. No better way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey and submit to his rightful place in your life. Father, help us to be challenged by the word of the preeminent one. He deserves first place in my life. God, we're in a battle. I I would be the first to admit I struggle with this all the time. It's so easy for me to put Lee in first place of my life. For me to call the shots and then realize how futile that is and how dissatisfying it is when I've usurped your rightful position of Lord. Oh God, I pray this for myself, for my brothers and sisters here, that we would fight that good fight as saints who have been made to be peculiar, particular in demonstrating the righteousness of God, the preeminent Son of God, Jesus Christ, in our lives. May it be so, Lord. May we pursue it with all our heart and mind and strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to sing this song again. I I chose it because I love the theological depth of the words when we sing uh, who He is. Uh, So the praise team is going to lead us again in singing, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. May it be a a way to um, recommit your life to Jesus being first place. Let's stand as we sing it together. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King, he the theme of heaven's praises, Lord in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ, who God descended, took on flesh to ransom us Come behold the wondrous mystery Be the perfect son of man In his living in his suffering never trace nor stain of sin See the true Right.
words of our redemption see the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death. No grave could ever restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected. As he will be when he comes. What a foretaste. foretaste of deliverance experiencing what God has planned for us then can start now if we keep Jesus first place in our lives hallelujah um, <clears throat> we have a quarterly business meeting today which will be back in the auditorium in a little while but first we're going to gather for a luncheon down in the gym a couple of instructions as you go uh, number one, it might not be a bad thing as we observe uh, social distancing and sterilizing guidelines to go wash your hands. <laughs> Actually, I'm just repeating what my wife says to me all the time. Honey, did you wash your hands? And I appreciate that she does that. Uh, so the bathrooms might be a little bit crowded for five minutes, but that's okay. Wash your hands or uh, is Jim out there? Jim? If you would mind, take one of the hand sanitizer. Look, he's on top of things. Thanks, Jim. When we get down there, you may go to a table. Uh, the tables have been separated according to social distancing standards. You're welcome to wear your mask if you need to. That's fine if you want to do that. Uh, you don't have to be a member to join us for the luncheon or the business meeting. You can't vote in the business meeting, but we're glad to share with you what God is doing in our church. And so you're welcome for that. So go to the table, wash your hands or sanitize your hands, go to the table, sit down. We will dismiss each table individually to continue to practice those guidelines. We're just trying to think of you and be safe as well as enjoy fellowship. All right, um, I'm trying to think. You know, <clears throat> Phyllis just loaded my head with instructions beforehand. I said, if I miss one of these, I'm going to be in her uh, dog seat. But I think I got them all, Frank. I think, I think I did. All right. See you down there. Go clean your hands, and we'll see you down in the gym. <laughs>